chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5. Thankful to be here again tonight. Glad to see each one that's here. We're going to continue with our study of doctrine. Tonight we're going to kind of get into the idea of theology a little bit. And uh, I'm trying not to, when I study these doctrines, not just kind of give you a random, just a random doctrine and some scripture to back it up. In other words, I'm not trying to just say, well, we believe baptism is this way and here's some, here's some Bible. But the reason, the reason why we hold to that particular doctrine and that why it is a doctrine of great importance to differentiate something. Uh, tonight, what we're going to look at is God himself. I think that's for trying to take them maybe to some degree in a, in a measure of importance. And I think once you move past the word of God as the foundation, then you go into the character of the word of God who is God himself, and the Bible, or rather who the Bible tells us that God is. So that's what we want to look at tonight. Who is God? And I'll tell you the doctrine. The doctrine that we believe is that there is one God, and we worship him as the supreme creator, and this God is in three forms, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And uh, each of these three forms are equal with the other. There's none that's less than the other. So I'm going to show you that, I guess, here in a moment as we go through this. All right, verse 1, 1 John chapter 5, verse 1. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and every one that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world and this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world but he that believed that Jesus, excuse me, believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that came by water and blood even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree in one. I'm going to stop reading there. Verse 8, when you go back to verse 7, look at the Word. What do you notice about the Word? It's capitalized. It's a proper name. He's speaking of a person. He's speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ there as the Word. John did that. You see that? And we're going to look at it in maybe a couple of other, before in John chapter 1, Gospel of John chapter 1, the first few verses. And then even in this epistle, the first few verses, he refers to Jesus Christ as the Word. So he says that there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word of the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And so what does that mean? Why, and, e, and even tonight, so why, why is that something that it's, uh, it's of great importance? It, it is. It's, it's something that is of great importance. It's something that we hold to as a, 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 a great and, and a, a, you know, one of our major doctrines, uh, and there's a reason for that. So you talk about God, who, who is God? And John gives us, you know, even here a little piece about who God is, that there is one God, but God is, that there is three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Uh, and these three, he says, are one. But who, who is he? If you were talking about God, you were talking about, uh, how would you define him? You say the God that we worship, who is he? Uh, the reason is God is a, God is a very general name when you use the word God and I'm going to talk about a little bit tonight the word God 
it's it's a very it's a very general idea. It's not it's not a name. It's not necessarily a, a name. Although oftentimes we use it in such a way that that that's kind of the way we use it. We use it as a name. We talk about and say, well, uh, who 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 who, do you, who who you worshiping, or maybe if you're praying, who you talking to? Well, I'm talking to God. Or, or maybe in our prayers we say, God, do do such and such. We we speak about that. You know, what does it say on the dollar bill or any coin? In God we trust, right? Well, who is God? Who is God? And that's an important question that we ask. That's not necessarily something that we do wrong. And I'm not saying that because even the Bible does that similarly. The Bible even speaks of God in that way itself. That the Bible refers to God as God. But when you... When we use the word God, what are we, what are we talking about? It, you know, we almost use it in the sense of a name, although it's not necessarily a name. And what's interesting is I, I mentioned, I think, a little while back at some point, that when, you know, the Bible doesn't even give God a name. The Bible, you take the word Jehovah, which means Lord. Or you take Yahweh, or Y-H-W-H, and people say Yahweh, kind of put some vowels in there. And they say, well, that's the name of God. Well, my question is, was that really God trying or attempting to give himself a name? When you go to the very scripture where that mentioned, where he made the statement to Moses, I am that I am. It's, it's, it's where it translates to Yahweh. Is that God trying to give himself a name or God saying, I don't need a name? I think it's rather the latter. I think it's God saying, I don't need a name. What, what, what do we have a name for? I mean, a name is given to, so a person can differentiate himself from someone else. I don't think we have any trouble differentiating God from another. There is only one God. And so the Bible uses that language. Why? But then again, why is that important? Maybe we're talking to others at times. And so maybe we run across someone and uh, that, that you're, you're talking with them. And maybe you talk with someone that's, that's a, a, a Jew. Or maybe you talk with someone who is Muslim and they practice Islamic religion. And you ask them, well, who are you worshiping? You know what they're going to tell you? And they worship God. They worship God. In fact, they say, well, well, what God? Well, the God of Abraham. Well, that's the same God I worship, right? <laughs> no. We worship different gods. Now, I want to try to take the Bible tonight and prove that to you, okay? I'm not just making that claim. I'm not just going to say that with it and being dogmatic. But when we use the idea of God, it is a very general idea. So it, you, you can't just say God and expect everybody to, to, to know this God that you're speaking of because there are other gods, right? But there is only one God. But how does the Bible refer to Satan? In 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 4. Well, he is the God of this world, right? And so the same exact word is used to describe God. And then you talk about false gods. The point that I'm making is that someone could say, I worship God, but then you have to ask the question, who is it that you're worshiping? And how can I know that the God that you worship and who I'm worshiping is the same God? The only reason, or the only time that God ever begins to differentiate, differentiate yourself is the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Uh, because there were other false gods in the world. And so God began to use and kind of a, a, a pick up the name of Abraham. And some have an idea, and I believe really the reason he did that is because of the covenant that he made with Abraham and the things that he has going on with that. So let me give you real quick a definition of the word God. If you Google God and you look up the definition in Webster's Dictionary, this is what you're going to find. I'm going to read it to you. Again, this is off uh, Webster's. It says, God, the supreme or ultimate reality, the being perfect in power, wisdom, and goodness. I say, well, that's the God I worship, right? Who is worshipped 
as in Judaism, Christianity, Islam, and Hinduism. So we all say we worship God. But are we all worshiping the same God? Well, how do you know? Well, you can't look at the word God. That's really about the only common thing that we have, right? Is we say, well, it's God. Or maybe that some of them, the Jews say, well, it's the God of Abraham. Or maybe even the Muslims say, well, it's the God of Abraham, right? Because they descended from Ishmael. And they will say that. But the only way that you can truly differentiate is by looking at the character of God. Who is the, or, or rather, what is the character of of God that they worship and they worship him then as the creator ruler of the universe uh, there's there's some other definitions that are mentioned here uh, a, a person of, or thing of supreme value which is you know a lot of stuff God a being or object that is worship is having more than natural uh, attributes and powers specifically one controlling a particular aspect part of reality uh, again you you get false gods, all of that. It, it falls right in the same definition uh, because God is a very general idea, but there is only one God. And in fact, when you get to, uh, just hold your place here, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 8 real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. What is an idol? An idol is a false God, right? That's pretty, pretty easy. So there were some of the early church that were having issues because there were people who were eating things that were sacrificed to idols. Now, if you sacrifice something to an idol, what do you do? Well, you just carry an animal out there and you kill it in front of a statue if you just want to get real technical about what you've done. That's about what you've done. You've just killed an animal in front of a statue is all you've done. And that's what Paul's saying. And he said, because we know that these idols are, are nothing. Look at verse 5. He says, for though there be that are called gods, though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us... There is but one God. In other words, we know the truth. And while all these other folks say that they're worshiping God, and they're worshiping this statue, or that they sacrifice something to this, to this God, we know that there's only one God. We know that there's only one God, the Father of whom are all things... And we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. And so what Paul's saying is that we know, even though there's all this that people call gods, it's all of this kind of thing, we know there's one God. There's one. And that is the God of heaven, that is the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, the Isaac, and Jacob. And we know him as God. All right. So go back to Judaism for a moment. When the Jews speak and they say, well, we worship the God of Abraham. Do they really? Jesus himself said in John chapter 8, that ye are of your father the devil and his work you will do. Now they can say what they want, but they were worshiping Satan. By worshiping themselves in a system. What is the character of who they worship? Now, I don't want, that's not my words. That's Jesus' words. He said, you are of your father the devil. What did he tell the woman at the well when she said, the Jews say that you've got to worship now in Jerusalem and go to the temple if you're going to worship God. And the folks that, I'm, that I grew up under in Samaria, and this in my own words, they say you've got to worship in the mountains. So she asked Jesus, so you tell me, since you're a prophet, where are we supposed to worship? And he said, you worship, you know not what. You talk about a slap in the face. He said, you don't even know who you're worshiping. 
And he goes on and proceeds to, 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 to talk to her. Of course, she gets saved there. The true worshipers that worship God worship Him in spirit and in truth. The point that I'm making is that you can't worship the God of Abraham and reject Jesus Christ. It's impossible. You're worshiping something else. And the Islam may say, well, we worship the God of Abraham. No, you worship Muhammad. What is the character of the God that you worship? Okay? Hold on to that. Again, you have the name of God, one that is given to distinguish God in three parts. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and these three agree. In other words, there's no disagreement between them. There's not one that's any different than the other. And some will say, well, Jesus, you know, Jesus was such and such. The Bible says that uh, in Colossians chapter 2, that in him was all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And what does that mean? That means there wasn't a thing that God had that Jesus lacked. He is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, you have to understand this after resurrection. We'll get into that in a moment. So you hold on to that for a moment. Is Jesus any less God than the Father? That's, a, that's an important question. Turn to Philippians chapter 2 real quick. Philippians chapter 2. Verse 5, Philippians 2, verse 5, you know this very familiar. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God. What does that mean? Thought it not robbery to be what? Equal with God. In other words, it wasn't taking anything away from the Father for Jesus to say that he was equal with him. It was not robbery to be equal with God. That's who Christ was. And then it says, made himself of no reputation took upon him the form of a servant, made in the likeness of man. Now don't get that form of a servant in the idea of just an attitude, because it, it's not, it, it is an attitude, but it's so much more than an attitude. But it talks about the condition of Christ when he came, and I'm going to get into that in a moment. So hold, hold your place right there, kind of mark that scripture, and turn back to John real quick. How is important? If this is the this is the point, if you reject Jesus Christ, you're not worshiping God. You may worship something else. You may call him God, but you're not worshiping the one true God. If you have rejected Jesus Christ, and any group or any religion that rejects the saving complete power of Jesus Christ has rejected God. And they don't worship him. They worship another God. Let me prove that to you. John, if you're in John, 1 John chapter 4. You see, while you're turning there, there was this thing one day and it and, and so I, I know it's, it's a good idea kind of in the background but when you really begin to get in it and break it down you say from uh, from the outside it's appealing you know say so, well that's it's a good idea and then you get in it and you're like well I don't know. there was a fellow made the statement one day he said just all of you know we got all kind of folks in here and we got Islams and we got we got Jews and we got Christians and we got and all worshiping together we all worship in God. <laughs> Are you? Is that really what's happening? You know, and at the beginning, it seems like, well, yeah, it's just kind of inclusion. You know, we're going to get everybody together. And if it's what you are, you worship what you worship. You know, nothing wrong with that. Verse 2. Hereby, hereby, 1 John chapter 4, hereby know ye what? 
Everybody says, well, that's a great spiritual thing. Well, hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Don't focus on how it feels. Focus on what He says. Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that what? Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of Antichrist. That's pretty simple. And that's pretty plain. If they reject Jesus, they're not of God. And they're not worshiping God. If they accept Jesus Christ, they may be in error. And they may be a long way from doctrine. But they are of God. Does that make sense? You see, we sometimes, if we're not careful, pride ourselves on our exclusion. But we would have kicked the church of Corinth to the curb, wouldn't we? But God wrote them a letter, and Paul went and preached to them. And so have we done well? I don't know. But the Lord took the time to write them a letter. I, I mean, I, I'm not going to get further in that. It's just something that's been in my mind, you know, a, a lot. If we, if we confess that Jesus is, is the Christ, again, I'm not going to get off into, into that. I think they've got to hold to doctrine, and, something to, and I'm not going much further in that. But what he's saying here is that if it, if the Spirit of God, if the Spirit of the, the thing itself will not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh, that Jesus is the Christ, then it's not of God. It's something else. So you can't say they're worshiping God. They don't even confess that Jesus is Christ. That's not the case at all. All right, so let's look at for a moment. John again makes a statement that there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit. We're made in the image of God. We're a three, threefold being as well, right? We're made in the image of God. We're a threefold being. We're made up of what? Body, soul, and spirit, right? Jesus Christ is the visible image of God. He is the physical image. And the disciples could not get that. They said, we would see the Father. And Jesus said, you seen me? <laughs> this is what he looks like, boys. And that's what he was saying. This is what he looked like. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. He is the visible image of God. Then you have the Holy Spirit, and you have the Father. And in the same way that we're threefold beings, the difference is we can't, if, we se if we separate, if, if our body, soul, and spirit separate, we're dead. But God's spirit and, and body can be separate from one another and it doesn't affect him because he's life. Now that's something that I can't wrap my head around. But that's what the Bible teaches us. Jesus is himself. The reason this is such an important doctrine is there are a lot of people that teach that Jesus was not God. And the reason that we are very... Uh, this doctrine is a very important doctrine. Is there, there are a lot of folks that teach that Jesus was somehow less than God, that he was not God. But the scripture is very clear, not only that Jesus is God, but that Jesus himself is the very creator that created us. John made the statement, was in the beginning... In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, that's Christ, all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Colossians made the statement in chapter 1 that Jesus Christ is the Creator. Revelation chapter 4 praises the Lord Jesus Christ as the Creator. Why is that important? Uh, John said that the Word, go back if you're still in John, go to chapter 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard,
which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, we have seen it, and bear witness and show it unto you, the eternal life, which was, uh, which was with the Father and was manifest unto us, that we have seen and heard and declare we unto you, so what's he saying? He's saying that Jesus Christ was the Word. He was made, and, and he, he was made flesh. We handled him, the Word of life, Jesus Christ. Let me turn to another real quick in the book of Hebrews. I'm going to read that real quick to you. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, God, who it, let you turn there, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath, this is verse 2, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. God, that's what he's saying, is Jesus Christ, the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, I can't wrap all that around my head, and, you know, but that's what the Bible says. Let me ask you this question. You talk about Jesus as the creator. Jesus is the redeemer. So we have God who is one God, but in three persons. The Bible tells us again, you go back to Philippians. Just turn over there real quick. We'll try to bring it to a close. Philippians chapter 2. But, verse 7, but made himself of no reputation. What does that mean? And took upon him the form of a servant. Paul is telling us that Jesus Christ was equal with God. But he made himself of no reputation. He took upon him the likeness of mankind. Let me ask you this. Before the cross, before the resurrection, when Jesus was walking around on the earth in human form, was he all-knowing? Most people would say, yeah, but he set aside his Godhood. In other words, he set aside his qualities of God. He didn't set aside the fact that he was God and that he is God, but he set aside his powers of being God. Does that make sense? You say, well, no, that's not true at all. Jesus knew everything. Well, then how did Luke say in Luke chapter 2, verse 50, true that he grew in wisdom? How can a man grow in wisdom if he knows everything? But Jesus grew in wisdom, and he grew in favor with God. Now explain that one to me. What the Bible is telling us is that while he was God, he became a man. And Jesus was completely man, and Jesus was completely God. But he set aside his omniscience. He set aside his omnipresence. He set aside those things, that the, the all power and everything. Did Jesus have great power? Yes, Jesus has great power great power but it was through prayer it was through his relationship with God that he did everything in other words it was God the father that was doing it through the son the great things that were taking place because Jesus himself was God I hope that makes a lick of sense <laughs> so there were things and there were times where Jesus didn't necessarily have every answer and Jesus didn't necessarily know every single thing that was about to take place. But there were at times he did. And the Bible tells us he did. 
And there are times that we can too. And I think we often miss that because the Spirit of God can reveal things to us as well. And a lot of times people, I don't know for whatever reason, people want to reject that and say, well, no, the Spirit of God doesn't talk with us and He doesn't reveal anything to us and, you know, that kind of thing. He's not going to reveal anything, uh, you know, against the Scripture and all of that. But, you know, how, how does the Lord call somebody to preach without revealing that to Him? How does the Lord maybe take one member from one place and move him somewhere else without revealing that to him? So there's times in the Lord work with the Lord, uh, uh, with, with Jesus the same way these things happen. I'm not trying to get into to all of that because you, you really get tied up ar around yourself because you really don't know exactly how all that relationship worked. But the point is this, that Jesus laid aside the, where his, his, his first estate and he took upon himself the form of a servant. He came down and became a man. And he was a man. In every way he was a man. And I think oftentimes we failed that. Now, John didn't make the statement. We go back to 1 John chapter 4 for just a moment, get real clear about it. Jesus, John didn't say that every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ was God. He said that, that every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. He was a man. What kind of man was he? Well, he was a man. The Bible said he was made in the likeness of his brethren. That he took upon him the seed of Abraham. That he was made in the likeness of sinful flesh. Romans chapter 8 verse 3. What was he? Well, he was a man. And he dealt with the same things that we deal with every day. And Jesus didn't have a leg up on us, in other words. But our salvation didn't hang in the balance because he, he had the character of God in him because he was God. There are three that bear record in heaven tonight. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. And tonight Jesus is God. He is the creator. Tonight there is salvation in no other. And only through Jesus can man be saved. There's a lot of folks that a lot of, will worship a lot of different things. But Jesus is the only way to eternal life. And tonight, if you did, have not trusted him, I hope you will while you have an opportunity to do so while we have verse of a song.